An horrific shooting rampage this week here in Washington. 13 are dead, including the shooter. What can we learn from the event, and where was God in all of it? Archbishop for the Military Services, Timothy Broglio, joins us. Meanwhile, the battle over the federal budget and Obamacare continues this week. A new congressional report says the debt is unsustainable. Democratic Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur from Ohio's 9th District is with us. And later, a media company brings wholesome, uplifting entertainment to families everywhere. The executive vice president of Walden Media, Chip Flaherty, is here to talk about their latest project on the Hallmark Channel. And finally, Rachel Campos Duffy, national spokesman for the Libre Initiative, returns to discuss the cultural stories of the week and our 17th anniversary celebration continues. The World Over Live begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We're delighted you took a little time to join us. Representative Marcy Kaptur, Archbishop Timothy Broglio, Chip Flaherty, and Rachel Campos Duffy are all straight ahead. As always, if you have a question or a comment about tonight's show, you can tweet me at Raymond Arroyo or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN.com. First up, Here's the brief news from the world over this week. The investigation continues into why former Navy reservist Aaron Alexis killed 12 people at the Washington Navy Yard on Monday. Earlier this week, investigators learned that Alexis had recently been in contact with two Veterans Administration hospitals for apparent psychological issues. Officials said he'd been suffering from a host of serious mental problems, including paranoia and a sleep disorder. He had also been hearing voices in his head. Alexis was killed in the ensuing gun battle with police. On Tuesday, Washington Archbishop Cardinal Donald Wuerl celebrated a special mass of healing and consolation at St. Matthew's Cathedral. He said the world needs greater healing for all that is broken in society that leads to such a tragedy. More on the Navy Yard massacre with Archbishop Timothy Brolio later in the show. And in their first pastoral letter in two decades, the bishops of Cuba are calling for political reform in the communist nation. They're urging authorities to replace Cuba's patriarchal state with a participatory state. Secretary of the Bishops' Conference, Father Jose Felix Perez, told the media on Monday that political change should accompany the social and economic changes already underway there. In accord with the principle of subsidiarity, the bishop's letter read in part, we Cubans are called to enjoy that freedom desired by God that allows man to obtain for himself and his family the fruits of decent work and participate in the decisions that affect his person, family, and social future. The Communist Party is the only legally recognized party in Cuba. Government officials have repeatedly said that changing the country's political system is off the table. And the Diocese of Hong Kong is appealing to the United Nations to pressure the Chinese government for religious freedom. To that end, it wants the UN Committee to investigate Beijing's compliance or non-compliance with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil Rights and Political Rights. China signed both of those. The Hong Kong Diocese charges that Chinese authorities have imposed political and religious policies that have been against the principles and the practices of the Catholic faith and have gravely violated human rights. The diocese notes that priests have been placed under illegal surveillance, house arrest, detention, abducted without a trace, illegally confined to hotel rooms, and forced to attend political classes or religious activities that are contrary to church teaching, and they've even been tortured. The National Catholic Partnership on Disability has announced its first recipient of the Young Adult Leadership Award. It was posthumously awarded to the poet and peacemaker Maddie Stepanek. 
McNatty is, of course, familiar to many of our viewers. He fought a nearly 14-year battle against a rare form of muscular dystrophy. And throughout his life, he was an advocate for peace, the disabled, and children with life-threatening conditions. Matty was a catechist also in his Maryland parish and a lecturer. He became a much sought after inspirational speaker and New York Times best-selling author before finally succumbing to his disease in 2004. The award is given for outstanding leadership in advancing access and inclusion of persons with disabilities into the life of the Catholic Church and the wider society. Jenny Stepanek, Matty's mother, will accept the award in his stead. A guild was recently started to explore Matty Stepanek's possible cause for sainthood. He was a remarkable young man. And Life Science is reporting the discovery of a biblical-era town where Jesus once walked. Archaeologists have found the remains of what is believed to be the town of Dalmanotha on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. Among the items discovered, vessels and jars, weights and stone anchors. Twenty years ago, a boat was unearthed in the same area. Architectural evidence suggests Jews and those following a pagan religion lived side by side in the community. Dalmanotha's only mention in the Bible was more infamous than famous. In the eighth chapter of Mark, it says Christ sailed there with his disciples. And when the Pharisees sought a sign from him, Christ says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them. And getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Well, it's been found now. And fans of Benedict XVI have started a campaign to show their appreciation for the Pope Emeritus and to encourage the professor Pope to keep writing if he's up to it. Catholic News Service reports that Pencils for Benedict, that's what the group is called, is the brainchild of Sonia Swabe, a web developer from the UK. She's encouraging people to write emails revealing what Benedict XVI means to them personally. The emails will be compiled into a book and sent to the Pope with a box of pencils, reportedly his favorite writing instrument. Swabe says it is a way of asking the retired Pope to never stop writing in order that one of God's exquisite instruments may continue to resonate. Can a pope ever really retire? Well, when we return, the fifth anniversary of the economic downturn, the budget battle here in Washington, and the future of Obamacare. We'll discuss it all with Democratic Congresswoman from Ohio, Marcy Kaptur, when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My first guest is the Democratic representative of the 9th District of Ohio. She's a member of the House Appropriations Committee, as well as the Defense and Financial Services Subcommittees. Here to discuss the battle over the budget, the saber-rattling over Obamacare, and this tragedy in the nation's capital this week is Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur. Congresswoman, thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's start with the CBO warning. The Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan budget office, just issued this report. It says the nation's debt is on an unsustainable path. And it's warning that by 2038, if it remains on this trajectory, that the federal debt will hit 100% of the gross domestic product. Is that sustainable? Can we keep on this track and do nothing about this debt and the spending of the capital? No. We have to both have economic growth mm -hmm. at the same time as we have budget rigor. And our problem has been mm -hmm. that the economy has not grown fast enough. So revenues aren't flowing in right. as fast as they should. They're getting better. Yeah. And But we still have this lag of yeah. seven over 7% 7 unemployment. This is a huge, just 7% of anything yeah. is a huge hit over a decade. Given that... Given these, these, the dire state of the employment scene and so many people just leaving the workforce, yes. unaccounted for, we don't even see them in the numbers anymore because they're not looking for work any longer. Um, and then when you, when you break it down and look at the, the, the black community, the unemployment is, is astronomical. I mean, it's right. unbelievable when you look at that, and I'm sure you see that in your own district. 
Uh, given all of that, we have Obamacare about to hit the economy at the top of October. That will kick in. There is a movement in Congress and real concern that when Obamacare comes, it's going to rattle small business and, and, and be a depressive force on employment. Your thought on that? My thought on that is that we need competitive insurance policies in this country. Mm -hmm. One or two companies shouldn't control the marketplace. And if you believe in competition, that's where this act leads. It leads mm -hmm. to competition, to exchanges, mm -hmm. where you can pick the plan that you want if you want to change what you have. Mm -hmm. So if you believe in competition, you should at least be open to this change. Can this law get us there. And when you see the Pew USA Today poll, where 53 percent of Americans disapprove of the health care law, 42 percent approve, it's the highest negatives ever recorded since its passage. Does that concern you? Well, it concerns me in that uh, people really don't understand how it's going to work. So part of the uncertainty is reflected in those numbers. Mm. But I think once people begin to uh, sign up, uh, once our systems work more efficiently, we're going to help to curve that long-term debt curve that you were talking about mm -hmm. because health care costs are a rising share of that. So we have to do something to fix this. Mm -hmm. And the emergency room is not the best place for people to get their care. And that's happening in too many places. It's the most expensive form of care. So my hope is we're going to be able to, to get through this. Congresswoman, when we have the Medicare cuts have been delayed, the White House has granted waivers to Congress, to special businesses to certain unions. Uh, so much of this has been delayed or exemptions have been granted. Why not grant that same exemption to the whole country until the kinks can be worked out legislatively here on the Hill? Well, I think because a lot of people are already included in the plan. Uh, if you have children up to the age of 28, young adults, they can be on their parents' plan, for example. Uh, Pre-existing conditions, you won't be denied uh, the rights to a policy anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, there are millions and millions of Americans who've been uh, been covered. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's already kicking in. Seniors have benefited, uh, those that are in the donut hole and have to pay over $2,800 a year for medicine. Uh, and by the end of this decade, they won't have to pay that extra amount. They get their generics at half of what they were paying before. So there's a lot of good things and in And yet, the AFL-CIO, and I'm going to play a clip. This is Richard Trumka. Listen to what he has to say. The Affordable Care Act does need some modifications to it uh, because as it does right now, what, what's happening is you have employers that, that the law says if you pay your, if your employees work 30 hours or more a week, you got to give them health care. So they're restructuring their workforce to give workers 29 and a half hours so they don't have to provide them health care. Is that a concern for you? It's a concern for me because I know that the uh, Taft-Hartley plans, that the not-for-profit plans, how hard they have worked right. to negotiate those over the years. And I hope that the Obama administration uh, will uh, grant them the kind of audience uh, and respect that they deserve. Mm. And, um, but it doesn't seem that happened this past week. They didn't get anything when they met with the White House. They seemed very upset. And I've spoken to some, some of right. the union leaders who said, you know, it's like I'm talking to the wall here, and I went to bat. I, I supported this plan. I wanted the universal care, and now we're left out in the cold. And they feel many of their members are going to simply lose health care and have to be thrown onto what they describe as low-quality exchanges. Is that a, is that a problem? I hope that it can be worked out, and I know that with so many things that happen in Washington, you just have to keep trying, and I know they will, mm. and members like myself will stand with them. Uh, what about in that this? What about this HHS mandate? The Catholic bishops have been very upset by the rules that came out of the Health and Human Services Department, vis-a-vis -vis providing abortifacients and contraceptives to their employees. Is there anything legislatively that can be done or should be done? In well, that that's why we worked so hard to get the executive order mm. uh, relating to the funding of uh, those services. And um, the president signed that, yep. uh, and it happened right before the bill was finally passed. Yep. Uh, now the administration is implementing it. The Catholic Hospital Association uh, agrees that, in fact, there is not a requirement that if you don't want to provide those services, you don't have to. But it is an insurance program. Mm -hmm 
so people can elect if they want to buy something, they can buy it separately. That's the way I understand it. That's what we voted for. Sister Carol Keehan has, has said that this is, she sees it as no obstacle. This week, or just last week, Cardinal Dolan said the bishops do not see it that way and that Sister Keehan's comments are unhelpful. And so, you know, he's looking at, you know, in a broader range of, of what's expected of Catholic institutions as well as schools. And she's only looking at hospitals and I think you know, her, her institutions well, particularly. Well, I think, well, you know, the Catholic hospital system is the largest provider of private care across this country. Right. And I think Sister is the one who's been in the hospitals. Uh, she's been in the emergency rooms. Uh, the sisters that I've known that are running these hospitals mm -hmm. are saints. Mm -hmm. They are saints. Yeah. And what they have done for the people of this country um, is, is remarkable. And so I represent many Catholic hospitals uh, across mm -hmm. my region of Northern sure. Ohio. And I believe those who are the hands and feet of Christ. And they are. Yeah. They're down there. They're in the trenches. Yeah. Uh, I think they know best. So Sister has, she has quite an influence on me, I can tell yeah. you that. Well, she, uh, Cardinal Dolan's been in a few hospitals too. And so have the, the many people who are opposed to this. And I think you'll grant that the employees uh, the private employees, they feel pressured because they have their own conscience and they say, wait a minute, why should I have to provide these services that violate my conscience because the federal government tells me I must? Shouldn't there be an opt-out for those people, a conscience opt-out vis-a-vis contraceptives and abortifacients in their, in their private health plans to their employees? Yes, they should be able to buy what they want. And if they want a special service, they should be able to elect it, but they shouldn't be mandated. Mm -hmm. So we're in agreement on that. Oh, okay. Let's move on to the shooting at the, at the U.S. Oh. Navy Yard. Um, you have for a long time tried to raise this issue of post-traumatic stress disorder and the mental illness that our troops are enduring and that people, uh, not only troops, some in emergency rescue situations as, as this shooter apparently was. Yes. Your thoughts on this and what we might be missing as we look at this tragedy. Um, oh, thank you for asking that, Raymond. This is something that is very close to my heart. Um, and I have seen for a number of decades mm -hmm. the Department of Defense, although they are changing slowly, mm -hmm discharge those with neurological conditions to the street. They do not discharge them to care. The most important thing we could do is to get every commanding officer who has a situation, whether it's active duty, whether it's guard, reserve, if someone has an issue, discharge to care. Mm. The VA is there for veterans who choose to go there. Do you know how many veterans leave the service and don't go to the how VA? Many? The majority. Wow. So if you, and those who have these conditions, don't they go need, there. Yeah, and they need the help. They need to, the military needs to do two things. It needs to discharge to care when they know they have a situation mm -hmm. they have to deal with. And when they recruit, they have to screen for violent behavior, mm -hmm. which is something that all of our research now shows us. Dr. Joseph Calabrese at um, University Hospital's case in Cleveland, Ohio, that serves the entire country, really, and the great work that they're doing there. Uh, has shown what is happening, why we have more violence in the military, because of the nature of who's being recruited, what they've endured before they go into the military, uh. and then what happens inside the military, and then once they get out, how they choose to solve human problems. And if they, if they engage one of these conditions because it's triggered by military service, they must be discharged to treatment. I can't tell you how many veterans I have met that simply are not. And you know what they do? They use alcohol to take them down, mm. and they use drugs to take them up. They try to self-medicate, and they make it worse. In our last moments, uh, while there was still an active crime scene over here at the Navy Yard, the president had a press conference where he instantly, almost instantaneously, started talking about Gun, gun rights and gun reform. Is that a misplaced emphasis? And are you concerned about the timing of that press conference to go forward to talk about that and then instantly talk about the fifth year commemoration of the economic collapse while the crime scene is still ongoing? Right. I think that um, guns in the hands of people who cannot handle them properly mm -hmm. is something our society has to deal with. However, at the moment, from what's come out already, what we've got again um, is a problem of unaddressed mental illness. Mm. This happened to be someone who had been in the military. We have it in civilian society as well. Most mentally ill are not violent. In fact, they're the chief victims right. in this country. 
but we are not properly addressing the conditions that our soldiers return with. And the DOD, Department of Defense, simply has to discharge to care. They have to figure out a way to do this right. Com the medical records of the Department of Defense and the VA have to be seamless, and they are not. This is a, that's a whole nother hour story sure. to talk about that. But those medical records have to be shared and we have to treat our people with respect and humanely. We have to get them the care they deserve and they have earned. Yeah. And after seeing Newton, Columbine, and now this, one would hope that that message gets conveyed. These were all people suffering from mental illness of some variety. And society it's time to have a conversation about yes, it we're adults we now do. we understand more about it we have many more um, pharmacological treatments mm -hmm. and other treatments and within the VA system and the defense hospital system we can properly diagnose and better treat mm -hmm. congresswoman captive thank, thank you, you so thank much you for, for being caring. here and thank you thank you well thank you as well and we'll have you back I All hope right. you'll come back. Thank you. Up next, the Archbishop for the Military Services, Timothy Broglio, will reflect on the tragic shooting rampage that occurred here in Washington that we were just speaking about and the lessons learned. The World Over Live returns in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. We're all searching for answers this week after a lone gunman opened fire at the historic Navy Yard here in Washington, D.C. on Monday. He took the lives of 12 people before he was killed by police. How are we to make sense of such senseless violence? My next guest has a unique perspective on the tragedy. He's the leader of the Archdiocese of the Military Services, and he's very familiar with the Navy Yard and the good people who work there every day. Joining me on set is Archbishop Timothy Broglio. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. It's good, good to be here. Thank what was you. your first reaction when you saw that this shooter had opened up on a cafeteria in, in mid, at 8.30 in the morning when people were just coming into work? Disbelief. Um, you know, having been to the Navy Yard many, many times, mm -hmm. It seemed almost incredible, and and yet we've had these experiences before. But yeah. uh, you ask yourself, uh, how is it possible? When will it end? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I suppose as you too, you followed the mounting right. toll of, right. of, of of fatalities, of victims. Yeah. Yes. No, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And 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 people always ask, and indeed, I saw a lot of email and Twitter traffic during this event. Where is God now? Where is he? Where was he, Your Excellency, and what's the lesson to be drawn from this event? Well, I think there, there are two principal lessons to be drawn. One, Almighty God always respects our free will, mm. and we can abuse that free will. So that's perhaps a, a, a blessing to all of us. Mm. But then secondly, um, to see how providentially uh, he enters into people's lives in, mm. in ways that were perhaps uh, unexpected or, or unthought of, uh, mm. certainly for the families of the victims uh, now is a moment of prayer but then also for those who who survived yeah. uh, it's a moment of giving thanks in your statement shortly after this tragedy you said somehow in part somehow we must restore the notion of respect for life into the fabric of the nation when the uniqueness of the human person created in the image and likeness of God is universally recognized the possibility of a mass shooting is more remote how have we contributed to this moment well, as a society I, as a society I think we have from the really almost from the moment of conception where uh, life is not necessarily respected or universally respected and then at the other end of that perspective, we say, well, if someone isn't producing, he can be eliminated. Mm. And I think that calls into question that dignity, which then the violent nature of our society uh, yeah. takes hold, and all of a sudden, that uniqueness is no longer is no longer respected. I was stunned in the wake of this tragedy, and we now know the shooter suffered from mental difficulties. Uh, he was hearing voices in his head. Now we discover one in nine of the members of the army, the soldiers in the army, who leave it, leave due to mental disorders. 
Does that surprise you? And you, do you see that day to day as you go about ministering to these troops? You see it certainly with those who are identified as suffering from post-traumatic syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, when that continues for more than six months, it's classified as a disorder. Mm -hmm. And um, they say, the statistic is even higher, that those who have been deployed, 98% yeah. suffer one way or another. Mm -hmm. Now, most are able to overcome that suffering, mm -hmm. but certainly it's something that our society as a whole has to address. Now, what do you think? He, th this particular man said, or it, it is claimed, he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder related to 9-11. He was apparently there at 9-11 or part of the, the emergency uh, relief early on. Is it time to have a national conversation about post-traumatic stress disorder? And why do you think it's hitting us particularly now and these particular troops as opposed to those in the past? Well, I think there are, there are a number of causes. For one thing, that the war that has gone on longer than any war in our history, mm -hmm. or perhaps I should say the wars. Right. So that's certainly one concern. I think also we're dealing with a, uh, a younger population that's more fragile. Hmm. In what way? Well, in the sense that uh, we're dealing with a generation where uh, when they were younger, they all received a trophy, whether uh -huh. you won or not. Uh -huh. um, and then all of a sudden you enter the world of work mm. and no one gives you a trophy for showing up. Yeah. It's expected. Uh -huh. And that's, that's, a, uh, that's something that has to be adjusted to. Yeah, the psychology and, is very different. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's uh, that's something else that uh, that that has to be addressed. Not perhaps even in the way we we raise children, but also uh, mm -hmm. certainly in in understanding the expectations of those who who are entering the, the workforce. This number is staggering. Twenty one thousand seven hundred and thirty five active troops were hospitalized for mental disorders in 2011. Twenty one thousand, almost twenty two thousand, a thirty percent increase from 2009. What do you attribute that to? And as you speak to these, because you're there, you're talking to these troops, you go to Walter Reed, you're interacting with them. What are they telling you? Well, they, certainly the, the experience of, of war uh, has, been, has been terrible for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think also the tension, uh, you know, so many, uh, because obviously we're dealing with a, an inferior force that is attacking a superior force, mm -hmm. so much of it is in terms of... Uh, of uh, I, um, bombing devices and so forth so there's that constant tension when you're outside yeah. even my own experience uh, the one time that I was able to visit Iraq um, the anytime you were out on the roads that was a constant you're on uh, edge yes exactly constant mm -hmm. tension and it's one thing to do that for a week it's another thing to do it for 12 months or, mm -hmm. or longer and then repeatedly to deploy have you been in touch with any of the families of these victims from I have not been in touch I was in touch with the uh, with the Catholic priest uh, yesterday morning mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I had word yeah. and he was um, actually when he called back um, because obviously he wasn't sure there when I initially called yeah. when he called back he said they were beginning notifications uh, to the families mm. always a very very sad no no our sad prayers facts. are certainly with all of those families before I let you go Syria has been so in the news the Pope mounted this day of prayer and fasting that for peace not only in Syria but throughout the Middle East and in the wake of that we saw this extraordinary turn of events the Secretary of State making an offhand comment Russia picking up the baton and now it seems for the moment at least bombings have ceased there won't be any any military interaction how much of that do you attribute to the Pope's uh, initiative. Well, I attribute a great deal of it to uh, to his prayer and to the prayer that he invited the whole church and really the whole world. all people of goodwill to join in. And I think um, I think that's had an immense effect. I also think that uh, as a, as as a people uh, throughout the world, we're tired of war, yeah. and we didn't want to see it open on on another front. Mm -hmm. And if uh, I remember when I was in Africa. The, the president was a, was a wise old man, Houphouet Boigny, and he used to always say, when you go to war, you fight, and then you sit down and come to terms about peace. Isn't it better to sit down first and talk before you go to war, or rather than yeah. going to war? Yeah, it's a good point.
They're good, and, and as you said, a wise man, Archbishop yes. Rolio. Thank you so much. You're for very, very out. welcome. And uh, to learn more about the Archdiocese for the Military Services and to read Archbishop Rolio's statement on the Navy Yard shooting, which you should, go to millarch. Org. My next guest has long been working to fill what he has called an unmet need, that is wholesome family entertainment that's both uplifting and challenging. He's responsible for bringing such films as The Chronicles of Narnia, Charlotte's Web, Holes, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and many others to the big screen. Here to talk about his latest film, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, and his latest venture, Walden Family Theater, is Walden Media's executive vice president and publisher, Chip Flaherty. Chip, welcome back to Raymond, the show. Thank you. Great Thanks to see you back. Thank you. I want you to start with, first of all, congratulations. Your new book, uh, The Real Boy, is on the long list for the National Book Award. That's not shabby. Pretty oh, it's good. A, it's incredible. I mean, there's there's only 10 of those that are selected a year. So it's an, when you think of all the thousands of books that are published, it's, a, it's an incredible award. And Ann Ursu is the author. She published, uh, we worked with her a couple of years ago with a book, Breadcrumbs. That yeah, it was a great you, book. You, I read that Fantastic. One. Yeah, you were kind enough to read it. It's a great read. Yeah. And uh, when you have talent like that, you know, you keep it in the stable, and she has just mm -hmm. been fantastic. And this book, The Real Boy, I think is, is maybe even better than Breadcrumbs, mm. which is saying something. Yeah. Tell me about this new venture. You all have now branched into television, and you've got something called the Walden Family Theater, which sounds like the wonderful world of Walden, but yeah. uh, like the old Disney. Yeah. Tell, tell me what this is. This is a partnership or a, a collaboration with the Hallmark Channel. You're exactly right. Yeah, the Hallmark Channel wanted to see if they could reach families, and they said, let's have destination programming. Friday mm -hmm. nights, 8 o'clock, just like Disney did back yeah. at, on Sundays at 7, uh -huh. uh, back in the day. And we had four programs that, that have come out. And uh, These the are one, movies. Exactly. Four movies that have come up, made for TV movies. But the production values are incredible. I mean, they could beat theatrical releases in terms of the production values that we have. And we also, every, so every Friday night, however, at 8 o'clock on the Hallmark Channel, there is a Walden Family Theater program. Mm. And tell me, what, what's the vision for this? I mean, obviously, you, could, you, you do bring, bring things to the big screen. Why television? What makes that a different experience for you as well as for the viewer? Well, we, you know, we always talk about multi-platform, or now the cool term is transmedia. So uh, I'll, I'll, you okay. know, yeah, there's nothing wrong with using the terms okay. of art. But, and it's just ways to t reach different audiences at different times through different platforms. Mm -hmm. And book publishing is a great way to tell stories. Uh, theatrical releases still are an unbelievable collective experience for a family to sure. go out and see the movies. But, you know, television on a Friday night to get the whole family together, we just thought that would be another great venue. And Hallmark was great enough to give us the time. And, and they, thankfully, they've been very pleased with the, with the movies we've produced so far. Now, the first one this season was Dear Dumb Diary, which is a mammoth children's series in, in literature. Uh, why did you bring that to the big screen or the little screen? Yeah, it's simply because it's a mammoth book property. I mean, it's 9 million copies sold over, mm. over 15 different books in the series. And it's one of those books that it's so accessible for kids. You could have great readers read it, but even problem readers or troubled readers yeah. who don't really read that much, they love it as well. So we really knew it resonated with everyone in that. And it's comedic and fun. Yeah, and, it, and it's a musical, too, which, you know, you and I both love yeah. the theater. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, they have some great musical numbers. So it really had just about everything. So we thought it was one of those good old-fashioned, kind of like high school musical, one of those good old-fashioned movies for the family. Now, the project that you're launching this week, The Watsons Go to Birmingham, um, this one has not only is it a, a story of a great family, but it also, you see them land in the middle of the civil rights struggle, really by accident. Tell me about this, and then we're going to show a trailer. Sure. It, it, it's an incredible story. I mean, it, again, it goes right back to Walden's roots, taking a Newbery Award-winning book and, and bringing it to the screen. Mm -hmm. And it won the Newbery back in the mid-'90s. Uh, Christopher, Paul, Christopher Paul Curtis wrote the book, and it's just a fantastic uh -huh. book. What I love about it is it's an intact family from Flint, Michigan in 1963. They decide to visit their grandmother, and you're exactly right. It what starts out as a typical family vacation and you think it's one of those like kind of you know one of those yeah. Griswold type movies right. and then all of a sudden they go right into Birmingham Alabama mm. right at the really the catalyst of the events that cause and, and, and really precipitate the civil rights movement mm. so it goes right back to what we talked about the common meeting the cosmic and a family staying intact because of their love in kind of you know having these events occur to them and it makes them tighter and makes them closer here is a clip of the Watsons go to Birmingham. Take a look. Children, in a few days, we're going to drive to Birmingham. It's time 
for us to see our family. And for you to get to know your southern roots. What's the word on them toilets? That's called an outhouse. You mean if I gotta use the bathroom, I gotta go outside into a little nasty thing like that? <laughs> we don't serve your kind here. You don't have to go around back to get something to eat. These boys, they're from Michigan. They don't know how we do things down here in Birmingham. Are you march? What were you doing out there? We were fighting for an equal life. Might be able to do some good down here. Students, for those of you who want to leave, I won't stop. When the world sees you walking in peace, segregation will fall. What happened? Someone called and said somebody bombed Joey's church. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. For strength and hope. Make America, America again. The 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham and that bombing is really central to this story. Without giving too much away, was it important for you all to keep that historical accuracy? I mean, there's a lot of that throughout this film. It really was. I mean, one of the most powerful things about the book and, 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 and the movie as well that, that is on um, this Friday night on the Hallmark Channel is the fact that it really is a portal to an unbelievable historical event. And rather than having it be a cold, like, textbook read in a, in a history textbook, you really get to kind of know these kids and know the fact that the one of the little girls, it's a family of three, really wanted to sing in the choir. And she's tabbed on that Sunday morning to say, yeah, you can sing in the choir with your friends before mm -hmm. we go back to Flint. And that's when all the events happen. Uh, mm -hmm. y you know, in that morning. So I think it's one of those things we always talk about, you know, Catholicism and sacraments and the tangibility to connect yeah. with the story. And you followed this family all the way from Flint, Michigan, and now they're hurtling right into a horrible historical event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's really has all, because we, you know, we know what's going to happen as adults, but kids really don't. They don't, But yeah. it really resonates and, and brings home, you know, just the courage and the faith. And, and really to realize that the church... You know, the Baptist, right. you know, they were really at the center of the moment. The yeah, this was a Christian movement. It was. It Martin was Luther King's right. whole movement and Ralph Abernathy, these were Christian pastors. Exactly. It, it, it was a, it was a nonviolent, you know, movement of love and peace and civil rights and equality. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times the history books, you know, Distort. Maybe, yeah, footnote that at best, mm -hmm. uh, if not completely leave it out. So we thought this book does an unbelievable job in the film as well as showing that nexus that absent that, you know the, the you know the civil rights movement might not have occurred or not might not have occurred as quickly. And just days ago was the 50th anniversary of that 16th Street bombing. The, exactly. The Baptist Church and, bombing. and it's one of the things that we thought, and we've had screenings throughout the country, and the reception has has just been incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been one of the I think it's one of those, you know, films that will really have an evergreen life because it's just a way for people to connect with this story. So it's incredibly resonant this week because it's the 50th anniversary, but we're hoping that this film, which is beautifully done, will be something that will make it accessible for kids in future years. And it airs September 20th on the Hallmark Channel, and you should certainly watch it with your family. And it's a great opportunity for the family to discuss what it would be like to be in the middle of that moment because I think even for so many black families, it, it has, it's so far away in the history. You lose sight of what your forefathers went through to get us to this moment. We, are, we have a black president, we have black Supreme Court justices. It was by no means a given at that time. No, and we go right back to that common meets the cosmic. You don't realize that they were, you know, they were school children that would yeah. you take the day off from school or whatever. That common people, you know, had this incredible event. And didn't King, didn't he orchestrate a children, wasn't there a children's march? Yes, and that's in the movie as well. Oh, really? And, and I think that's so important nowadays for kids because I think mm -hmm. they can feel so detached from the events around them sometimes. They yeah. can seem so fast, and they should realize that, you know, slowly they get, they're getting a voice, and they can be, have that transformative, you know, effect mm -hmm. on the world. So to see that kids 50 years ago did it and against incredible odds. Yeah and challenges. I think it's just a great message for kids. Now, tell me what's next. What are you working on now? Anything for the big screen? Well, we have, we, we have a couple of books coming out, but we start filming in the fall in South Africa, The Giver. Oh, Again, typical Walden provenance. Book, yeah. yeah, unbelievable book. Lois Lowry, Newbery Award winner, sold has sold over five million copies, mm -hmm. and really is the first of that dystopian literature. Now you see the Hunger Games and everything yeah. else, but I, I think it's the best of breed in the first one, and I, I think it's going to it's going to come out next August. We're filming uh, in the fall, but I think it's going to be a really big movie. Wow. Well, we wish you yeah. the best, Chip Flaherty. Thank you so thank much you for being here, and we will check in with you when the new movie That's comes great. out. Thank the you. Watsons go to Birmingham.
is on the Hallmark Channel this September 20th. Don't miss it. It's well worth your time. And you can find out more about Walden Media's great projects at Walden.com. And continuing our cultural vein, my next guest was a cast member of MTV's The Real World San Francisco in the mid-90s. She's a frequent guest host on ABC's The View, as well as a columnist and blogger. She's now the national spokesman for the Libre Initiative, an organization for advancing economic empowerment in the Hispanic community. I sat down with her earlier to discuss the cultural stories of the week. Here's Rachel Campos Duffy. Rachel Campos Duffy, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, let's start. There was a Walmart commercial recently on that got you excited. It's actually a little bit. It was. It came out a while ago. Okay. But, but you wrote about it. You were excited about, about it. it. Yeah. Why? Why? Why was Walmart commercial drawing your I was attention? excited. It was a Hispanic woman, and she talked about, you know, earning her 20 years of service at Walmart, and she talked about the home she bought and, and how she had tough times when she was on welfare and how excited she was when she called the food stamp office and said, thank you very much. I'm not going to be needing your help anymore. Wow. And sort of the the dignity that she gained from this job. And, and, and also an example of somebody who used the social safety net the way it was intended mm -hmm. um, as a temporary measure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just recently the Pope was in Brazil and he talked about the dignity of work. He was talking about youth unemployment, which is very high in Europe. And yep. we're on that and, course. You know, we're on that rising course. Rising here. Rising here, especially for blacks and Hispanics. And he talked about how we we really receive our dignity when we earn our our bread. Our daily bread. And yeah. today, the way things are going in our government, we're actually disincentivizing work. I don't know if you know, Raymond, but there are states, uh, 30 of them, at least 30, maybe 35 of them, where you can um, earn more money on welfare than you can, you know, taking an entry level <laughs> job at minimum wage. There's some, and the most generous welfare states, you can earn more on welfare than you can as an at, at an entry level job as a computer programmer or an entry level job as a teacher. But again, going back to what France is saying, this the the dignity that comes from earned success, we're robbing. Um, we're robbing our people of that, and more importantly, we're robbing our youth. I mean, looking at this high youth unemployment, these are peak years of learning how to work, how to build a work ethic. And they don't even have an opportunity to do that. I mean, no. the, the, the opportunity is just being denied them. The opportunity is being denied them. And, and if you look specific, you know, I work for the Libre Initiative. Right. We work with Hispanics. I mean, this is, this is what we bring to this. Mm -hmm. You know, we are particularly and uniquely positioned to, you know, take advantage of the American dream to access it. And what we bring is a work ethic and entrepreneurialism. We start businesses at three times the rate. But we have this government system and these, and these community organizers who are, who are trying to tempt people into not just not just using the social um, safety net and entitlement programs, but ultimately trapping them in, in a life of dependency. So you like that this Walmart commercial sort of advertised the American dream in action. I do. I think it. I think it was one of those really beautiful, yeah. um, you know, finally an uplifting commercial that yeah. we could all well, be I, proud well, of. Well, I thought for a moment you were considering a career as a greeter, which I've often <laughs> contemplated. But hey, I think it's 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 you know what? That's a great. And I'll tell I, you, for retired people, it's fantastic. It's you're a, out and about. You're connecting with your neighbors and friends. Not long ago. Uh, Ashton Kutcher was on. Was he a greeter? No, but oh, no, no, no. He but but he Walmart. went on the Teen Choice Awards and talked about that there was never a job that he was better than. Mm -hmm. And we're losing that. We're losing that. I agree. I agree. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago about your concern for the Hispanic population. Both people here are those who are coming here. Mm -hmm. uh, Archbishop Chaput recently gave a speech where he talked about the, at one time, it was understood or people tried to understand and, and propagate the notion that newly arrived Hispanics would be a moral leaven for American society. When in fact a lot of the demographics and the statistics tell us now Hispanics have a higher rate of abortion, they're ending marriages at a higher rate, on and on and on. Tell us about the corrosive effect of the secular society, which was really the heart of his critique, yeah. how that secular society and the a society here in the United States does change the very values of the people coming into it. Well, you know, we have um, out of wedlock uh, births are now uh, through the roof. Through the roof, at fifty percent. Or African Americans are at se over seventy percent. Hispanics are now going over fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, what this really is about? It's about two things: the breakdown of the family. Um, the replacement of the father and the family yeah. with um, with government. Yeah. Um, that's the new baby daddy. Um, 
And then, of course, the ubiquitousness of this really raunchy pop culture that you and I talk about all the time. And yeah. we saw this in, in you know, this past month in, with the Miley Cyrus thing. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. But again, to think that because you're Hispanic somehow and you're Catholic and you believe in Our Lady of Guadalupe, that your children, um, you know, are going to be inoculated from mm -hmm. what they're mm -hmm. seeing is not the case. And, you know, um, a lot of us, we try to, you know, monitor what our kids, you and I have had yeah. lots of conversations. How do you monitor what your kids, we have all the, we're deluding ourselves if we think, I mean, we should obviously try our best, right. but to think that we can put them in a bubble and that this popular culture is not going to infect um, the, the culture at large and, and even from good Catholic parents, that's just not the case. Yeah. And so it means that we have to work harder as parents and we have to try to the best we can to infiltrate the popular culture with good stuff. I am so tired of talking about Miley Cyrus that I hesitate to even bring her up. I know. But the fact is she does matter. And she you've written matters. about this, you've talked about this. She's also got the number one video online that's in the history of, yeah. of online videos. What is it about Miley Cyrus that strikes such a chord in people and why is it so important to Little girls, particularly. Um, here's why I think Miley matters, and it isn't about her performance, mm -hmm. although it was really ugly and raunchy and, and, and really lacked beauty and sensuality. I mean, it really was um, just very, very disappointing. Mm -hmm. It's not that. What I am seeing here and what I'm concerned about mm -hmm. is a youth culture um, that, by the way, is um, created by adults. Yeah. Uh, that is very dark. I mean, we look at everything, even from the, mm -hmm. the Harry Potter season, or the Harry Potter series, that mm -hmm. you know, the vampire movies. This, we're creating this very dark world. Whatever happened to, you know, enlightening and offering hope and 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 presenting virtue and beauty and things that can help people understand that they can actually transcend bad circumstances. Yeah. Sure, some kids have bad um, bad circumstances, not all of them, mm -hmm. but we are we are doing something, I think, um, very tragic. And then on, on the feminist side, what bothers me with, about Miley Cyrus and why I think she matters, it, 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 specifically for girls, is that we have created a pattern because of this, you know, this new Disney thing where, you know, you do a Disney show or whatever, and now the way you emancipate, the way you exit girlhood, in, yourself. Yep, mm -hmm. exit girlhood and enter into womanhood. It, it always involves taking off your clothes and objectifying yeah. yourself towards men. And this is not what our brave suffragists fought for our girls. I think they'd be really disappointed. And, um, and that's what concerns me. What are we presenting as a culture to girls about what real empowerment looks like? And that's a conversation as mothers and fathers that we need to be having with our girls. And we really need to offer alternative models because the culture is telling them Well, that else. is why she's so important, Miley That's Cyrus, right. because she was an icon for so many young girls as Hannah Montana. Yeah. And they have grown up with her, and they're watching her for cues. And as you said, she's hardly Susan B. Anthony. So yeah. let's, yes, let's no, shift. She she, but she is sort of a gateway drug, if you will, to yeah. this brave new world of trashiness and the notion that you do, you have to expose yourself but to be Can I say validated. something else? There's a lot of really good Catholic families out there who think, well, I don't let my kids watch this. And I didn't let my kids watch Hannah Montana. Guess what? Yeah, they yeah. they know who Hannah Montana is. It doesn't matter. This is what I'm talking about all the time to parents. You can't put them in a bubble. They're going to know what it is. So you better know what it is, and you better offer an alternative. Yeah, and the pop culture is like air. You can't stop it from getting to your kids. Precisely. So you've got to deal with it. Uh, there was a child development study that came out that yelling at your teen is actually leading to worse behavior, and it is akin and they aren't just talking about the yelling that you and I as being <laughs> Hispanics sometimes engage in. They mean verbal abuse toward a teen, that that is akin to hitting in that child's psychology. Your reaction to that report? Well, I would say that there are probably some you know, verbal abuse that can be as, as damaging to a child's self-esteem. But, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because culture does matter. I remember having a conversation in college with my mom on the phone, and my Asian roommate afterward was like, is everything okay? And I'm like, that's just how we talk. You know? <laughs> so, you know, in our house, if you, you know, put up a camera, there'd probably be a, a lot more yelling than maybe in yeah. some other homes. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think it, 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 it depends. I mean, you know, there's now, a, there's a the line theory. where... There's a, well, you have to separate culture from really Absolutely. abusive language and abusive speech, but I agree with you. I'll never forget the first time. <laughs> Rebecca's going to kill me for revealing this. My wife, the first time she came to, our, to my house, no. which, I think it was Thanksgiving, we're all sitting around the table and talking, and blah, blah, blah. we're engaging in conversation. There was some disagreement. We're, ah, yeah. voices weren't uh -huh. raised. 
Well, Rebecca gets up and she goes in the other room. I find her in there crying. I said, what's wrong? <laughs> oh, I can't believe what these people are carrying on. I said, this is, a day, this is a Sunday dinner. What are you talking yeah. about? They're fine. Come That's out. Exactly Everybody's fine. Happened. Italians and Hispanics. Hispanics this is what happens. This is what happens. <laughs> Let's talk about the... And by the way, I wouldn't yell at my kids if they would just listen. If they would, if they would just do everything they're yes. told. Yeah, I'm right with you. Uh, yeah, I don't want that. I don't yeah. want this child, these child yeah. studies in my house. Uh, there is this thing that's emerged. Time magazine had this piece, and the headline was, When Having It All Means Not Having Kids. Yeah. There's an agenda out there that seems to be sure. advancing this notion that if you really want to be happy and really fulfilled as an adult, Mm -hmm. Don't have kids. You can tour the world. You're footloose and fancy free. You can change relationships on a dime. What's wrong with that as a mother of six? Well, I've, I've been really surprised um, in, in my own life. Like, you know, I just wrote that, Wal uh, that Walmart piece you brought up. And, like, half of the comments were about how many kids I have. And, oh, really? Yes. And, and I have been on blogs where people have called my children, you know, envir environmental terrorists. That oh, I've, you're sucking that, up all those resources. Yes. And I've, I've, I've overused my allotment of carbon footprint or whatever. I mean, there really is an antinatal, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's tied up in, in the feminist movement um, in, in a lack of appreciation for, um, for, for our, really, for the beautiful part of our gender. We have the the lowest birth rate in America in our history right. since 1909. This is the low. 2012 was the lowest birth rate on record. This year will no doubt drop yeah. again. We're going the way of Europe. Why are we worried about this? Right. Well, we're going the way of Europe. I think probably the economy has something to do with it, but there is something. Uh, 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 Perhaps it's a selfishness uh, uh, um, and a lack of appreciation for the beauty of, of, of children. I mean, you know, Mother Teresa used to say, um, too many children, because I get asked a lot about my, how many oh, children bet. I have. Um, I'm like, it's like saying we have too many flowers. And finally, our anniversary celebration continues this week. It was on the 21st of September, 17 years ago, when we launched The World Over. In addition to the breaking news of the week and the in-depth coverage, we've always brought you interviews with the world's most outstanding artists, particularly singers. And over the years, it's been my pleasure to interview some of the greatest musical performers in history, people I've loved a long time, like Keely Smith, Placido Domingo, Dion DiMucci, Aaron Neville, and the great Andy Williams. They all gave us a little something special. Here's a skip down memory lane. You went from The Wanderer, which I am going to ask you to do a little bit of because it so captures. Do you see that as kind of capturing uh, your, your kind of uh, tough guy street approach to life early on? Or is that, is that a misnomer to try to assign that song to you, personally? Well, first of all, let me explain the song. Mm -hmm. I roam from town to town. I go through life without a care. I'm as happy as a clown with my two fists of iron, but I'm going nowhere. So the song turns back on itself, and it's really saying, you know, yeah, I'm this and I'm that. Happy as a clown, not a, not a happy yeah, character. It's, no, it's a song that's showing that, you know, it's, it's, it's has a little no, uh, awareness to it where the guy just yeah, huh. Sees for a second, he goes, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's <laughs> this a little is truth, not getting, bitter truth yeah, in it. Right, yeah. right. It turns in on itself. Because a lot of people think it's about a lot of fun, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I understand that, you know. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm the type of guy that likes to roam around. I'm never in one place. I roam from town to town. Find myself falling for some girl. I hop in and that car, my How have you managed to keep this voice, I mean, I just heard you not, not too long ago, to keep this voice in such amazing condition at 68 years old with this tireless schedule? What do you do? What is the technique? Well, I think I'm, I'm lucky to, to be healthy, first of all, to really work my technique, to across the years, across the time, to decide which repertoire I will sing which, in which part of my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's, the, it's the, the, the great passion that I have for this. <laughs> Thank you.
Aaron, your music changes people's lives in a way that others, uh, you may be entertained by other music, but you rarely hear autistic people responding to music and calming down. People stopping from committing suicide when they were con contemplating it, and you've gotten those sorts of oh, letters. Yeah. What is it about your music that has that effect on people? Well, all I can say is the God in me touching the God in them, because I don't take credit for it. You know, it's like, mm. like I say, it's, it's been medicine to me right. in times in my life. When it's like uh, times when I felt like giving up, it showed me the, end, the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, it told me everything was going to be all right. Yes, Jesus loves me. at all these people, working with Louis Prima, being with Sinatra and the Rat Pack and all of these people, and think, why me? No, because I think God does everything. And I am very close to God. I talk to him all the time. He's with me everywhere I go. <laughs> and I truly believe he has a plan for you. He has one for me. He has one for whoever in this world. Mm -hmm. And it was his plan. And even today, if I'm not sure about something, I ask for guidance. I just tell him, give me, you know, let me make the right decisions. I've never questioned things. I still don't question them. <laughs> I don't question why somebody like Britney Spears goes from this beautiful <laughs> young thing to this whatever she is now, you know. I don't know why people did that with her, because she is absolutely a, a lovely young girl. Mm -hmm. I don't question what makes the grass green. And a lot of people <laughs> I know do question everything. And I just figure, I put my life in God's hands. And whatever he intends for me to do or be or go or say or whatever is going to happen. Before I let you go, can you fulfill a huge Christmas wish of mine? Now, what would that be? Could we sing, I wish you a Merry Christmas? You want to sing, I wish you a Merry Christmas? You and me, All together. Right. We wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Harmony with the great man himself. Thank you. Such great people. And a special thanks to you, our World Over family, for your support all these years. We'll share some more memories with you next week. In the meantime, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. I'll keep you updated throughout the week. And the links are at RaymondArroyo.com on the left-hand side. By the way, if you sign up for my free e-blast at RaymondArroyo.com, I'll send you some important stories I see throughout the week, preview upcoming shows, and I'll send you the link to the YouTube posting of this program. In the meantime, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.